Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I tackle intangible assets, from what they are, to how an investor may measure them, to the challenges when trying to account for them. Intangibles, as we've discussed in past podcasts, have increased in their importance, particularly with technology stocks and other high growth companies where the value is not necessarily in hard physical assets. Investors will want to continue to educate themselves on intangibles. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this discussion on intangible assets. Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, a subject that I think we've kind of hit on in a few of our more recent podcasts, um, specifically uh, the podcast we did with Partha Mohan Ram, and then also the one we did with Kai Wu, and it's on the subject of intangible assets. Um, you wrote an article a few months ago, Jack, where you started out by looking at the five largest companies in the market. They still may be the five largest today, so it's Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, and you were kind of making the point that you know, these companies make up 20, 25% of the market, maybe even more now. And, um, but the vast majority of the, the, the things that they produce or the assets, even on their balance sheet, you know, aren't necessarily physical goods. Um, I mean, Apple has the iPhone, but you know, more of their profits is coming from sort of the ecosystem of services and apps. Microsoft, obviously is software. Amazon is kind of like, a you know, they have the distribution centers, but they're obviously kind of acting as a online retailer. And then you have Facebook and Google. And so I think, you know, what you were trying to get at with this article is that one, um, intangibles are becoming becoming a much more important piece of the value of many of these businesses. And two, and this is where I'll, I'll kind of let you take it uh, from here, but is, you know, how as investors, you know, we need to start thinking about this and start trying to think about ways that maybe we can measure intangibles. Um, but then there's sort of pluses and minuses with that as well. Right. So if you look back 30 years, I mean, the biggest companies in the market, the largest, the companies with the largest market caps all had significant tangible assets. Now, now, if you look till today, you just listed those five companies. I mean, if, if you tried to value any of those companies using just their tangible assets, I mean, let's, let's think of Google for an example. Like if we start valuing Google based on its, you know, buildings and its servers and, you know, things like that, we're not going to get anything remotely close to what the true value of Google is. Because if you think about it, the value of Google's search engine is really important. The value of their technology, the value of their brand, the value of their patents, all those things are the value of Google, but they're not reflected anywhere. You know, if you go pull up Google's balance sheet right now, you're not gonna find any of that on there. And so the question is, as investors, and particularly as value investors, do we need to rethink the way we're valuing companies? Because especially when you look at something like price to book, all this value is not showing up on the balance sheet. And so what, what, if any, adjustments do we need to make as investors to reflect this new world we live in versus the one 30 years ago where tangible assets dominated? Can we just maybe take a step back too and talk about what sort of the, what, you know, what is an intangible asset, um, you know, just generally from a category perspective? Sure. So the, the opposite of an intangible or a tangible asset would be something like a building, a server, you know, any physical type of thing. And then the intangible assets would be things like your patents, your brand, your technology. And, you know, again, look, looking back at those five companies, I mean, that's the majority of the assets for the firms that dominate our economy today. So you could argue, and, you know, there's been different numbers as to what percentage of asset of the total assets in the economy are intangible but it's probably pretty close to half at this point. So we're missing a big piece when we look at, you know, when we look at financial statements, if we're just looking at the tangible and we're not looking at the intangible. One of the questions that we asked uh, Partha Mohan Ram was, does financial accounting need to evolve to sort of account for this, um, you know, increase in intangible assets? And, and he sort of views it one way, but then there's the NYU professor who's kind of written a lot about this, Brock Lev, who has sort of been on record saying, you know, these antiquated accounting uh, methods really need to evolve to take uh, intangibles into 
um, consideration. So you have two very smart guys, you know, sort of at ahead, if you will, um, in terms of how to, you know, how to look at intangibles from an accounting standpoint. Yeah. And, you know, there's one thing they both would agree on, which is that we need to take into account the value of intangibles when we value businesses. The difference is, you know, should the accounting authorities be valuing them or should the practitioners who are analyzing the businesses be valuing them? And, you know, there's, there's two sides to that argument. The, the positive side is obviously these are a, a huge part, as we talked about before, these are a huge part of the value of companies. And so if they're not on the balance sheet, we're, we're missing a huge part of the value of companies. This, the counter argument though, which we'll talk about in a little bit is these things are really, really hard to value. And so when you start looking to accounting authorities to try to figure out what the value of Apple's brand is, I mean, it's, it, no one can really figure out the value of Apple's brand, but you know, so the value they come up with, you know, the rules come up with may be very different than the reality. And, you know, if, if you're trusting companies to tell you what the value of their intangibles are, they're, they're likely to inflate them. And so you, you have sort of a double-edged sword here. There's, there's no good answer to this. I mean, there's the strong arguments they should be on there because you want to account for the value of everything a company has, but there's strong arguments they shouldn't because it, these things are very, very difficult to value. So if we were to try to use reported financial data to try to back into um, sort of the valuing intangible assets, how would we go about doing it? What, what would be one, one, one way? So the most common way to do it is to, you know, you want to find the things that you spend money on that actually create these intangible assets, you know, the brand and the technology and, you know, things like that. So the two obvious things that you, you would find are research and development expense and either advertising or SG&A. Um, and the reason I say either advertising or SGNA is if we had advertising for every company, that would be the ideal way to do it because advertising, you know, helps to create a brand. But a lot of companies, you know, Apple, for instance, don't report advertising expense. And so if I use advertising, then I'm not getting any value for those companies. So what you end up doing is using sales general and administrative, which includes advertising, but also includes some other stuff that you may not want in there. So there's no great way to do that. But in, in general, people will use SGNA just because all companies will report SGNA and other companies won't report advertising. But basically what you do is you take those expenses, you know, right now those things are expenses. So in the year you spend money in R&D or the year you spend money in advertising, that's an expense. It reduces your earnings. But those things are actually creating value in the future. They're creating assets which will generate earnings in the future. And so what you do is you would take those and instead of expensing them all in the first year, you would expense them over time. You would treat, treat them just like a tangible asset. So I might say, you know, one tenth of my advertising expense, you know, I turn my advertising expense into an asset and then one tenth of it, I would expense each year going forward. And so what would happen is those things would then go on the balance sheet, which would increase the book value of these firms. And also it would impact earnings because now, you know, my current year's R and D expense, instead of taking all of that and, and treating as an expense, I would only take one tenth of this year, but I also would have one tenth of last year and one tenth of the year before. You know, you would have this constant amortization going on where you're slowly expensing these things over time and treating them like you treat assets versus treating them as something you expense right away. Yeah, like think of a biotech company. You know, a biotech company is plowing all this money into research and development. And, you know, they may have a blockbuster on their hands or they may have a drug that doesn't get FDA approval. And so in that sense, you know, that money basically is being expensed. So it's being deducted from, or profits, it's, you know, on the balance, it's on the income statement, excuse me, as an expense. And it never really shows up on the uh, balance sheet. And like Kai Wu, like explained, like a lot of times, I mean, advertising is a little bit, you might know what you're going to get, especially companies that are really good at advertising. There might be, you know, a big difference between direct response advertising and band brand building advertising. But in the case of like drug development or something, you know, it's like it can have a huge blockbuster results potentially, and then it can be worth nothing. And I think the, um, and this is also fr from our uh, interview with Kai Wu, he was sort of explaining that um, I think it, it, the FASB accounting board, you know, they tend to take a conservative view with these accounting principles. And when you're trying to measure intangibles, you know, it's actually not very conservative because there's such a wide range of outcomes. Um, if, if a company builds a plant, they, they are going to be able to get a much better sense of what is going to be produced on that plant, which is an asset, and the revenue and profits that are going to be derived from it, where the intangibles, you know, there's, there's a much wider range of um, outcomes there. The biotech is a great example because a biotech could spend money on R&D to develop a drug, and that money could end up being worth zero. You know, a lot of the drugs just go nowhere. And so, 
when you're trying, and then they could spend money on another drug and it could be worth, you know, a thousand times what they spent on it. And so how do you value that money they spend, you know, when they're spending it, you don't know what it's going to produce. So that's the hard part about valuing these intangible assets is you just don't know in, in a case like that, you know, it could be like a one or zero type thing. It could be a huge hit or it could be nothing. And you have to try to figure out what that's worth. And so that, that's an argument, I think, for maybe why we should not put them on the financial statements. And maybe we should just let practitioners, you know, figure this out themselves, analyze the drugs and see wh where they think, you know, the drugs are going in the future, because it's just so hard to come up with a value when you have outcomes like that that are so wide ranging. Yeah, the other way that you can try to get at measuring intangibles is using alternative data. And so um, Kai sort of explained how he uses natural language processing to kind of comb through um, text to try to find companies that um, are, you know, maybe being more innovative and have uh, more intangibles uh, in their value. Yeah, you know, this is getting away from now we're getting away from the balance sheet and the income statement and saying if we're not going to use the balance sheet and the income statement, you know, what else could we possibly use to try to figure out what these things are worth? And so, you know, one thing we could do, for instance, is we could look at patent filings. You know, when, when any company files patents, that's public information. You could look at the number of patent filings or, you know, patents tied to other patents. I mean, there's different ways you could look at it, but you could try to use that data to say, what are the value of a firm's intangible assets? Or, you know, there, there are outside companies that give that provide values on what they estimate the value of a company's brand is. So they would give you the estimate of a, the brand of someone like Apple. So you could do that and you'll probably get a much more accurate estimate of Apple's brand than you would by trying to take their advertising expense, you know, and amortize it over time because it, the, Apple's brand is probably worth many, many multiples of what they've ever spent on advertising expense. And But this, this also has limitations because you know, there, there's only a small group of large firms that these companies that do determine the value of a brand even look at. I mean, the vast majority of public companies we would look at probably do not, don't even have a value in that database. And so there's no great answer to doing this, you know, no matter how you look. I think what Kai's, Kai is on to something in terms of, I think that's a better, using these more advanced methods is a better, more accurate way to do it than trying to use what's in the, the balance sheet and the income statement. But even that is subject to a lot of problems. You know, either you can't get the data or you don't know how to interpret the data. It's just, it's very, very, it's something that's very, very difficult to do no matter how you do it. Yeah, the other thing he looked at was like patent filings. So, you know, the more, so we would comb through the U.S. patent filings to find the companies that had applied and been granted, you know, the most amount of patents and then sort of tying that to, which is, you know, those are intangible intellectual property. Those are an intangible asset that, that are potentially worth something. And so he kind of did it that way um, as well, sort of looking at the patent filings, um, which is interesting. Didn't just going back to sort of the more traditional, isn't a, a, a O'Shaughnessy's enhanced price to book take intangibles into account? Yes, that, that's basically what we were talking about before. What, what they did is they took, you know, advertising expense and R&D expense and they amortized them over 10 years. And they treated, you know, they added it, those became assets and they added those to book value. And then they recalculated the price to book using those values. Um, you know, and they, what they found is they saw better results from the price to book. So the price to book had a better, you know, had better performance when you did it that way. But I don't think they saw good enough performance to include it in their composite because one of the things O'Shaughnessy has done, you know, did a while back is they took price to book out of their value composite, even though it was in the VC2 composite in his book. In the real world now, they've determined, you know, they don't want to use price to book anymore. And even with the enhanced price to book, I still don't think they found enough value to put it back in their value composite. So it's just price to book is a, is a tough thing right now because you, you just don't know, you know, we're in a different world and you don't know the value of these intangible assets. So for a lot of companies out there, price to book is just is a tough thing. And, and as I said before, even when you start enhancing it with what's on the balance sheet, or what's in the income statement, you know, it, it still is, you're still not getting an accurate value. You're making things better, but you're probably not making them accurate. Well, and we, you actually ran, we actually have a version of the enhanced price to book. And I was very excited because I thought it was going to be like, you know, some big breakthrough for us. But what you pointed out was, and the way we run investment strategies is very, very focused, very concentrated. So for example, if we're running the, you know, Piotrowski um, model, which uses book to market or price to book, you know, we're building or we're basically tracking very focused 10 or 20 stock portfolios. I think what you, what you found and what you explained to me was, you know, even with the enhanced price to book, you're not within that deepest value stock sort of decile, let's say, or the cheapest stocks in the market, you know, your the enhanced price to book actually doesn't change that much because a lot of those companies actually have a lot of tangible assets. They're not the types of companies with the intangibles, right? 
Right. So the whole question of how much of an impact are intangibles on the valuation of companies, it totally depends. And there's different groups where it makes a, a huge difference. So at the top end of the most expensive stocks, trying to look at Google's price to book, I mean, they might as well not print it on the internet because it's completely useless. Google's price to book tells you nothing. But then when I get down to these, you know, steel companies that are in the absolute cheapest decile of stocks, well, it tells me a lot more because those companies have a lot less intangible assets. And so what we did is we took the regular price to book, we took the enhanced price to book, and we looked at, I think it was the bottom, you know, 200 companies or something in our database and said, how much, if I use the regular price to book and come up with the cheapest 200 companies, and then I do the same thing with the enhanced price to book, how much does that list change? Because that will tell me about the impact of intangibles down there. And it was, it was something like the list was 80 something percent the same. So what that shows you is that there, these, this is less of an issue in the really, really cheap stocks, and it's a massive issue in the really, really expensive stocks. You know, price to book is certainly useless in the expensive stocks. It may have more value than people think, though, at the bottom of the barrel, just because intangible assets are having less of an impact there. And the one thing to keep in mind with price to book, you know, the reason academics keep using price to book is one, it's a proxy for value. So it looks like all the other, you know, when, when you try to define value, it does just as good a job as the other metrics. And two, it's very, very consistent. So when you look at flow measures like price to cash flow or price to earnings, they change a lot. And so you have more turnover in your value portfolio. When you use price to book, you have less turnover. So that's why, despite all these issues, You'll have academics like Ken French coming out and saying, we still think price to book has value. And I think in, in this lowest part of the, you know, the, these cheapest stocks, he, he has some, even though I've been negative a lot in price to book, he has some degree of a point because it doesn't change things that much to incorporate intangibles down there. You sort of ended the article with talking about Warren Buffett and how when Buffett first started investing, he was really a deep value investor cut from the cloth of Benjamin Graham. He migrated under sort of the tutelage and partnering with Charlie Munger to become more of a sort of high quality, um, you know, compounder, a bit more of a big brand type of investor trying to buy great companies at reasonable prices. And then just recently, I'd say over the past five years, he's even um, evolved uh, more and, you know, he's purchased Apple and acknowledged uh, the, the value in these companies with intangible assets. And so, I think the point that you were making, and I'll let you wrap it up, is that uh, you know, as an investor, even as quantitative investors, we have to try to think and try to evolve our investment strategies. Um, here at Validia, I think the, the way we've evolved our strategies is looking outside the initial set of models that we started with in 03 and looking for other strategies that are different um, <clears throat> and use different investment criteria. Uh, they're still all quantitative, but you know we've kind of branched out to look for other models within the growth momentum, sort of the high quality shareholder yield sort of areas of investment strategies. But the point is, is that you know as as investors we have to think and be aware of the changing market landscape and the changes in companies, and our strategies um, have to evolve with them. Yeah, Buffett's a great example because every great, and he, he's potentially the greatest investor of all time. Every investor who's been great has had to evolve over time. So it's, it's very easy for us to say, all right, let's just run our deep value strategies the way we've always run them and let's never change them. And who cares about intangible assets? I've got 80 years of data to back up what I'm doing. But you can't do that because within those 80 years, there's going to be shifts. And there, that doesn't mean you have to stop believing in value investing, but it does mean you maybe have to take a look at the way we're implementing value investing and say, is there a better way to do it? Or is something changed in the world where maybe the way I'm looking at companies with the price to book is not the appropriate way anymore. And so although we still use price to book in part, I mean, it's not a major part of what we do. We use it in part. I think all of us who use price to book have to say, let's look at this going forward and say, does it make sense in the world we live in? Or is it better, you know, maybe to find some way to incorporate these intangible assets and to incorporate the true value of these firms into our process. And maybe we'll get better returns doing it that way. Good stuff. Uh, well, we appreciate you guys listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.